I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the status of Ukraine funding from the United States and its implications on the war, we have with us Max Bergman, who's the director of our Europe and Eurasia program here at CSIS. Max is a frequent guest on Truth of the Matter. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Max, let's start out with the big picture here. What has happened on funding, and especially given the chaos in the House? So what's happened is that Ukraine funding has run out, effectively. Last year, the Biden administration went to Congress four times. Uh, The last one was right before Congress changed hands in December and got a lot of funding from Congress. But not only that, they also got what was really important, something called presidential drawdown authority. Now, every year, the president will have this drawdown authority. But the Congress increased it from $100 million per year. And this is money you can just take equipment from the U.S. military and send it to Ukraine. And they increased that from $100 million to $14.5 billion. And that was really critical. But as of October 1st, that money has gone back to $100 million. So basically nothing. And right now there's no appropriation to really provide Ukraine with significant assistance. And so how does the recent news about Speaker McCarthy's ouster impact the prospects for future funding? Well, I think what we have to realize that over the course of this year, there was a lot of confidence in Washington of the Biden administration, I think of most people on the Hill, Republicans and Democrats, that a supplemental appropriation was going to happen for Ukraine. And in August, the Biden administration came to Congress, which with a rather small request for roughly 20 billion, 24 billion in Ukraine security assistance with the idea that this was going to be a routine thing. They were going to come ask for 24 billion now, and then in four months, they'd come back again. So we're basically appropriating roughly about $100 billion a year for Ukraine, $50 billion security assistance, $50 billion economic assistance. The hope was that in passing a continuing resolution that that was going to be tied together with Ukraine funding. And then what happened as the continuing resolution, which was passed in the House and then in the Senate for 45 days, well, that got decoupled. And so now with the toppling of Speaker McCarthy, who had expressed support for Ukraine but was stuck and has been stuck because, frankly, the House Republicans are divided on this. I think roughly half, more than half, support Ukraine funding. But the Speaker of the House is never going to want to bring a bill to the floor that divides his party. And there's a vocal minority that opposes Ukraine funding, but that was currently enough to get in the way of a Republican Speaker bringing this to the floor. So we don't know what's going to happen going forward. You know, who's going to be Speaker? Will they be reliant on Democratic votes to become Speaker? So how this plays out, I think, is anybody's guess. But I think what has now dawned on Washington is this sort of presumption that everyone had, I think, as of like September 29th, September 30th, that Ukraine funding would find a way through and it would just sort of be cobbled together with the budget. Well, that is no longer the case. And now I think there's growing pessimism, particularly among reporters that really follow Capitol Hill, that Ukraine funding can get through. Because if any new Republican Speaker of the House is going to be reliant on those that are firmly opposed to Ukraine funding. I mean, no one also knows how the budget's going to be funded after 45 days. So a lot can happen. But we are in, I think, a very different place than we were a week ago, where I think right now the bet would be against Ukraine funding, and that has huge implications for Ukraine, for Europe, and I think for the credibility, frankly, of U.S. foreign policy going forward. Do we know how divided the Republican caucus in the House is over the funding of this? Let's be clear. Massive U.S. response uh, to to this war uh, has been bipartisan. So the previous supplemental funding bills passed with a huge bipartisan majority. And I think today, if you were to bring a bill to the floor, it would get a huge bipartisan majority, maybe even 80 percent of of the House, maybe even 90 percent in the Senate. But the dynamics are that if a Republican speaker were to bring to the floor uh, Ukraine funding, that Republican speaker could potentially lose their job, as we just saw with McCarthy. So that's the that's the current dilemma here is that you have uh, still majority public support in the country that 
actually public support has remained really firm in support of Ukraine. I mean, we're talking about foreign aid here and it's above 50 percent, which is, you know, which is very strong and in some ways unusual for, for, for any foreign assistance. Yeah. And so I think the public supports Ukraine and we see bipartisan support. That was sort of why there was general confidence, I think, in Washington uh, up until uh, the weekend that that Ukraine funding was going to happen. But now we're just in a, in a very different place here because of the uncertainty uh, uh, on Capitol Hill. And Republicans aren't kidding. They're saying the majority of us in the House do support this. But as we just saw, it's a minority that could really stop this whole process from happening. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's it's a minority. And, and let's be clear, Democrats are firmly in support of Ukraine funding, but they essentially re- weren't willing to shut the government down over Ukraine funding. So when the CR came up with a con- continuing resolution without Ukraine funding, Democrats you know, just weren't willing to shut down the government. So the question here is that the leverage that that I think many folks thought that, that these two were tied together, they've now been separated into two separate issues, funding the government and funding Ukraine. We don't know how that's going to play out, uh, but that uncertainty has real implications. Okay. So President Zelensky this week has said, quote, I am confident in America. What does this mean for Ukraine? So I think it's really important for people to understand that the president does not have some magic wand that he can just wave. President to, Biden. President Biden or any president that that they can just wa- uh, wave and say, well, I'm going to send all this equipment to whatever country. I don't care what Congress says. You can't do it by executive order. Can't, can't do it by executive order. Or at least let me put it this way. I think you will have lawyers in the White House, State Department, and Defense Department pouring over something called the the Security Assistance Manual, looking to see for any loopholes that may exist. But but the answer is basically no. Now the president can you know press a nuclear button, he can order you know hundreds of thousands of troops to war, but what he can't do is simply just give away U.S. military equipment that's been paid for by Congress to another country. And that's true of you know if President Trump wanted to you know hand over military equipment to another country, Congress would object and, and and it wouldn't happen. And so there's laws and rules that prevent this. And really to provide equipment to another country, you have to have funding and you have to have the authorities as we describe it in security assistance parlance. So what this means for Ukraine is that if the funding is cut off, that there, as I mentioned, this thing called presidential drawdown authority, which is the most important aspect that is basically an IV drip into the Ukrainian forces fighting on the front lines. This, what this does is enables the Pentagon to go and say, Ukraine, what do you need? Okay, you need that demining equipment. You need those mortar rounds. We have them. We have them in our stocks, and we're just going to pull them out of the warehouses, put them on a plane, and get them there. And right now, the Pentagon uh, has some money left over. There's been these stories about an accounting error uh, in the Pentagon where it found five to six billion left. And everyone sort of made fun of this, but it actually makes sense. Like, what, what, is, what is the value of like a 30-year-old artillery round that has there's no market for? Right? It's hard to value that. It's hard to value it. And what the Pentagon did is it went and looked back and said, well, all the, you know, we're going to, you know, the value of this is actually should be a lot lower. And so by doing that, they have found more money. And what folks have to realize is that, you know, the Pentagon is run by rules, one of the largest bureaucracies in the world. And those rules are laws that uh, they have to follow. But they found more money. And that gives Ukraine probably two to three more months. We've been spending of this presidential drawdown authority about $2.5 billion a month in taking equipment from the U.S. military and giving it to the Ukrainians. And that would run out, you know, before Christmas. And then after that, It becomes so much harder because what the U.S. will be able to still do is provide security assistance. But what the difference is that security assistance, so there's something called the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. The State Department has the foreign military financing account, which is how Israel and Egypt are funded through security assistance. This is not money that goes to Ukraine, actually. But this is money that goes to industry to uh, to build equipment that the U.S. buys and then gives to a foreign partner. It is not money that the U.S. can take and take from U.S. warehouses, from the U.S. military. So they have to buy it. Now, buying something takes time. So if you want to buy that demining equipment that the U.S. military had since the 1980s, well, does a company still build that equipment? What, you know, How long would it take to get that? So you're then starting looking at 
you know, lengthy timelines. But guess what the Ukrainians are doing right now? They're fighting the Russians. They're engaged in a counteroffensive. They also have to defend their cities from a potential Russian military onslaught of missiles and, and drones. And will we be able to provide Ukraine with additional uh, Patriot interceptors or other ammo that is used to shot, shoot down missiles and drones? So if not, do the Ukrainians sort of let the Russians hit their cities and they protect their, their forces in the, in the front? I mean, what I'm getting at here, Andrew, is that this has real battlefield implications. And the lack of U.S. funding is not some sort of theoretical thing that is just some accounting trick. Ukrainians are going to die because of this. And it could, frankly, I think, turn the tide of the war back in Russia's advantage if, if Ukraine is really now being starved of basic munitions that it needs to fight this war. Yeah, and winter is coming. And what happens if our funding for them dries up for one of these reasons you've just pointed out? How long can they you know, hold, uh, hold down the fort? So this is why it's sort of critical that the Ukrainians have some clarity here. Because maybe, you know, this is, this is so impactful that it could prompt Ukraine to alter their battlefield plans and say, you know what? We think our counteroffensive, maybe we have them on the ropes, but if we don't, you know, make more gains, then maybe we need to pull back and protect our the territory that we've gained. It may alter how they go about fighting this war. And that's something that is really critical. What you don't want is to just lead the Ukrainians along and say, oh, it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. And then suddenly it's not. So I think that's really problematic. The Ukrainians will be in a very tough spot. This also, I think, will have to prompt our European allies to step up is, is not the right way of putting this now. I mean, the Europeans, frankly, have stepped up. They are providing a lot of assistance, according to the Kiel Institute, which has been tracking this. They now have maybe surpassed the U.S. in providing total aid. The problem is that when you open U.S. military warehouses, you see a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff there. When you open most Euro European military warehouses, you don't see that much stuff. The stuff they had, a lot of it they've given to Ukraine. Uh, so there just isn't as much for Europe to actually just give off the shelf. But I think what Europeans have to recognize is that they need to just give whatever they can. And it's worth depleting European readiness further. So the readiness of European forces to fight to support Ukraine. And this is where I think, you know, Biden can do something is by maybe sending more forces to Europe. If Europeans are depleting their militaries, if Poland is going to send some of their, let's say the Korean tanks that they've just bought and, you know, they just bought them brand new. They spent a lot of money on them. Well, maybe the U.S. You know, helps reassure Poland and other Eastern European states a bit more than we were planning to do because we know they're, they're going to deplete their readiness. The other thing I would say is this is where we pointed to this a number of times at CSIS and pointing to there's a real role for the European Union here where they borrowed for COVID. They borrowed 800 billion euros for COVID. You can borrow about 100 billion for, for this war and then incentivize a country like Poland. Give away your new tanks here's money to replace them. And the EU then makes that a co kind of collective responsibility, something they could do. They haven't yet really considered it. We haven't asked them in part because we were reassuring. You know, the U.S. was saying, no, we're going to be there. We'll be there. And I hope we will be. But I think it's time for people to really start thinking about what if we're not, because it's not up to the Biden administration, really. It's up to the current situation in Congress. Max, a lot to think about. This is all really illuminating. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 